near mint condition, the home of collected oh, edition. That cover is so awesome. This is Mr. Chris Claremont. A legend. Melanie goes, eat some Happy Monday, all you Minties. Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for your advanced look at the Avengers Omnibus Volume 5, celebrating 60 years of Avengers assembling? Yeah, that sounds about right. So, let's go ahead and get started. And welcome back, everyone. Now, before getting started, a big thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks of Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on September 27th or 26th, depending on where you get your books. Now, we are looking at the cover to issue 122, and this is the direct market cover provided by Rich Buckler. On the left-hand side is your standard edition cover by Gil Kane, and that is the cover to issue 144. And there is a difference in the spines. So I just want to make sure people know about that. Everything else underneath the dust jacket is identical. So I just wanted to come back to this. So we have the Avengers right here. This is the cover to issue 122, as I mentioned, by Rich Buckler. And I did want to state that normally with standard editions, they have been doing modern covers, but... They've decided now to just make them both standard and direct market the classic covers. So we have Thor, Iron Man, Black Panther, and the Vision with Scarlet Witch back there. And predating the boxes here with the faces. I oh, love that era. Uh, the Avengers. And you have Engelhart, S. Buscema, Tuska, and Pedass. The talent right there. Uh, this iconic image from Giant Size Avengers number 4 and Volume 5 right there. And here are all the covers of the issues collected in here. The retail price of this book is $100. So I've done overviews of Avengers 1 through 4 if you want to go back and watch those videos. But this is the first time we're having this book released. Those were reprints. This is the first time we're getting these stories collected in omnibus format. Well... Most of these stories? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 all the stories. All right, underneath the dust jacket, let's take a look here. The dust jacket first, the secret of the celestial Madonna revealed, and it is. The creators on the right-hand side, like Steve Englehart, Sal Buscema, George Tuska, George Perez, Bob Brown, John Buscema, Dave Cockrum, Don Heck, and the Avengers Omnibus. So this has been pretty much the same format they've used for the previous volumes. There's the Avengers, a new lineup. What's the blue furry beast doing there? We'll talk a little bit about that. Volume 5 and then the logo right here. So, cracking this open, excited to talk about this era and showcasing the artwork while giving you a, a synopsis as to what some of these stories are about. And then, of course, taking a look at the build of the book. All right, let's go ahead and open this book up. We have some black end sheets. The Avengers Omnibus, Volume 5. What it collects, Steve Englehart, Sal Buscema, George Tuska, and George Pettis taking the top billing as the storytellers. The uh, Squadron Sinister shows up here through these pages. Here are all of the credits, and by now, no more are the colorists going uncredited. We actually have colorists. Um, there's some nice notes in the introductions from Steve Englehart about the colorist. It's pretty interesting. And then here's your table of contents with this young lady now playing a big part. So I can't wait to talk. I talked a little bit about her in volume four, but now she's being completely fleshed out. And an introduction here from Steve Englehart. So collected in this particular omnibus is Avengers 120 to 149, Giant Size Avengers 1 through 4, Captain Marvel 33, Fantastic Four 150, and then material from Foom. 6 through 7, and number 12. The book has 856 pages. And kicking it off with issue 120 here, where we have the Zodiac attack the Avengers. Bob Brown supplying the artwork. And I think I've talked about these type of spread pages before, uh, but Steve Englehart talks about them here in detail. 
So in order to cut corners back then in the 70s, uh, Marvel decided that they were going to pay a little less money for the pages that artists were drawing. And in order to do that, what they did was blow up one particular page and have it to be a spread page. And they did it. And you can usually tell when it's being done because of the thicker ink lines and it's so much darker. So this was originally one page is what they paid for, but they blew it up into two pages. And they did it for quite some time. I remember Roy Thomas talking about it in some of his introductions. And he, <laughs> he did state he couldn't remember who came up with the idea. And then at the end of his introduction, he's like, it was probably me. That sounds like something I would have done. Uh, so you will be seeing some of that through these very same pages. Now, this is when the Zodiac invade. And by now, we're, we're having a little more of this mysterious woman being fleshed out. You know, at first she was kind of like the swordsman's girlfriend, half Vietnamese. And here is where you find out exactly, well, part of her origin, as one of the stories suggests, an origin of Mantis, not the origin of Mantis. But you can see one of the Zodiacs is related to her and how exactly he, he dives a little bit into her cosmic background. And if you've not read the story of the Celestial Madonna or don't know anything about it, this is where it comes from. Now, this mantis is a little bit different than the one from the movie. I mean, she still has some of the same attributes like the martial arts. and But the, as far as the emotions, she's not as powerful as the mantis in the movies. But she plays a bigger, important part through these pages. And in this issue, you get to find out... You know who her father is here's another one of those blown up spread pages and who her mother is and what part she plays so she was part of this priesthood known as the pama who were supposed to be keeping an eye there were kree who were supposed to be keeping an eye for the coming of the celestial madonna the person that is supposed to give birth to the cosmic messiah and they were a group of pacifists, so, you know, the Kree were all like, nah, you're separated from us. So they had issues with that. And what they decided to do was, and it goes into full detail, and you can find out exactly for yourself how all this happened uh, through these pages. What they decided to do was kind of give Mantis, and she was one of them, a taste of human life by wiping away her memories and that's why she wasn't able to remember and that's why i said she's a little more fleshed out here she's no longer just hitting on all the guys in the avengers by now it's it's actually not even a love triangle but now a i guess a love square if you will between her and swordsman and then scarlet witch and vision and she keeps going back and forth we have the titan the mad titan show up through these pages and it's so cool to read the behind the scenes as a favor to jim starlin uh, who wanted to continue the story over into Captain Marvel and asked Steve Englehart if he could do the script while he did the plot. Uh, we have the very first giant size Avengers, which has the all winner squad. Of course, Roy Thomas is a huge fan of that Golden Age era, and that's why we ended up getting the Invaders. Rich Buckler comes back as the penciler for this particular giant size. And again, funny to read the behind the scenes because Steve Englehart is like, oh, but I wanted to write the giant size number one. But he gets to write a lot of giant size. So now we have the Claw teaming up with Solar here. We have Sal Buscema doing the main issues. And this is a lead into the Fantastic Four number 150 because these characters are related. There's a big wedding that's going to take place in issue 150 of the Fantastic Four. And you can't have a party without the Avengers showing up. Now at the end of this particular issue, we have this villain showing up after being gone for about oh my goodness about four years or so he hadn't shown up in avengers but kang makes a return and his return makes a huge impact on the team because he claims that there's a star on top of the avengers mansion and he says that the celestial madonna is going to be or, or that's where she is her location is somewhere around here and he wants to marry her so he can have this lineage continue because you know how kang is from the future and crazy and wants to take over everything and his way of doing it is just like oh yeah i'll just uh breed the lineage he keeps coming back to this particular time i love it and again you have more of a development between the vision and scarlet witch and of course mantis and swordsman 
And there's a wonderful thing that Steve Englehart points out in the introduction. And he's talking about how you have all these crazy stories going on about a celestial Madonna. Um, but I wanted to write people like real people. So while these horrible things are happening, these cosmic things are happening, these huge fights are happening, there's some drama going on. And he goes back to the days of reading comics, love comics from Marvel. You know, Steve uh, talks about how Stan Lee loved romance and comics, and that's why we had all this drama in Spider-Man, which there's a lot of truth to that. But he was writing romance comics too. Now we have a death in uh, this particular giant size issue right here of number two, one of the Avengers dies and the team is shaken up by that. Uh, now we have this amazing Kang, Immortus, and Ramatut uh, kind of revealing to each other who they really are and what part they play in the future of each other's life. And Kang sticks around for a long time, just causing havoc after havoc. Uh, let's see here. Oh, that's the, what are they called? The Undead League or something like that. Agatha Harkness comes into this particular issue to cause more drama. We finally get an origin that was hinted at in the Kree Scroll War of the Vision. I don't know if you all remember that or not when Ant-Man crawled inside of the Vision to help him out in, what was that issue, 93? Uh, he's found something, and it doesn't really get talked about until these issues right before issue 136. And uh, a big wedding happens, so some of the Avengers are scattered about, so they need to start over anew. You can find out by reading Giant Size 4. And how they start over anew? Well, that's where the Beast comes in. Now, worry not, issue 136 of Avengers is just a reprint of the Amazing Adventures number 12 which was part of the beast transforming or mutating into the blue furry beast. So you get the cover here. If you think something's missing, that's why. Uh, here's issue 137. So here's where the new lineup starts shaping up. Moon Dragon's left over from the Celestial Madonna story. She's kind of a badass in her own right. A little more pompous than Mantis. Uh, that was the other thing that I was going to say is Mantis through the pages here. She also may sound a little bit different than what you're used to if you're coming from the cinematic universe. Because she, um, she refers to herself as this one. That's how she talks instead of saying I or me. Uh, let's see. So yes, Moon Dragon ends up joining the team as well as the return of a couple of older Avengers like Yellow Jacket and uh, the Wasp. But then we get a huge surprise as to who joins the Avengers. It's a character that not... I don't know if I was reading comics back then, monthly, I would have been like, what the hell? I would have been so surprised. Because there's this young woman that comes knocking on the door at the Avengers Mansion. She's looking for Beast, and she's looking to cash in on what Beast promised her. And if you read The Amazing Adventures by Steve Englehart, where I said Beast mutated into this blue furry beast, you know who that character is. And it all goes back to what I said about Steve Englehart talking about how, you know, Stan Lee loved romance comics and that's what he wanted to add to this book. So he brings in Patsy Walker, but we'll talk a little bit about her in a few. Uh, because what we've been looking at here is mainly artwork by Sal Buscema, artwork by Rich Buckler, and artwork by Bob Brown, little George Tuska in there. But here comes the age of the legendary George Pettas. And nothing wrong with those other artists. They're phenomenal in their own rights. But there was just something special about George Pettas. And it's really cool to go back and read these issues. Because you start seeing the evolution of this artist. Uh, although in the first issue that he draws. Jim Starlin had to go behind him. Not behind his back. Just behind him. Because editors demanded it. Um, and redraw the beast. Like his face. They weren't happy with the way that George drew the beast, so they were like, okay, uh, Jim Starlin, go and uh, draw the beast's face the way it's supposed to be. Now, that's nothing new in comics, right? I'm sure you've heard many stories of Jack Kirby's Superman face being redrawn at DC Comics because DC wasn't happy. So it's really cool to see Steve Englehart just bring in a lot of the things that he loved. Romance comics with Patsy Walker, and then, I'm sure you noticed this, a bunch of Western characters, like the Two-Gun Kid, or Kid Colt, or Ghost Rider, or I guess Phantom Rider. I think he was known as Knight Rider at first, uh, through some time traveling, because Kang is still hanging around, 
and never overstaying his welcome. I love him. He's my favorite character. And then we get issue 144. Uh, so issue 144 is the cover to the standard edition and shows the Hellcat comic. Now the cat was a character uh, that had shown up previously and that's her costume. And of course some people probably know that the cat turned out or mutated into Tigra. But somebody needed to don the costume of the cat. So they ask Patsy Walker who's been helping them here uh, for the last few issues. And she says, okay, I'll do it. But I'm going to be known as Hellcat. And she joins the team. Now, she's not the only one that joins. Oh, there's a couple of fill-in issues because they were kind of falling behind because the Serpent Crown story was about to start. This is the Tony Isabella issues with Don Heck on artwork. And it's just for a couple of issues about an assassin going after the Avengers. And then we get back to our regularly scheduled program with Steve Englehart and George Pettis. And the, it's the conclusion, but the ongoing story of the Serpent Crown that features the Squadron Sinister. And again, Hellcat joining the team. Here's all the characters that play a part in each of the teams. And again, George Pettis' phenomenal artwork. And it's so cool to see him just get better and better. Uh, now, of course, issue 149 is the last one. Uh, and it doesn't wrap up all of Steve Englehart's issues. Because I think he did three more. He was on the book for about four years. So this stops at 149. I think he went all the way to 153, 154 maybe. I can't recall. Now here's the extra. So you have interviews. You have the Foom stuff. Um, you have the house ads back here. The one thing that they don't have that I really wish they would have added was this picture that, or this cover from the Spanish edition of the Avengers 144. Uh, Steve Englehart was going on about it in his introduction uh, for the, I guess it would have been the 15th Marvel Masterworks of Avengers. He was saying, yeah, uh, Carlos Pacheco did this amazing image. Carlos Pacheco, gone way too soon, did this amazing image while Gil Kane did the American uh, 144. But the Spanish version, Carlos Pacheco did. And he kept going on about how much he loved that cover. But sadly, it's not added to the extras back here. Uh, the, these do have all of the reprints and the treasury editions and covers um, for the for all the indexes and, and reprints, but not the ones from overseas. So if you can find it, let, leave a link down below because I'm curious to see what he's talking about. Original art right here from Bob Brown, John Ramita. Uh, more internal artwork, John Buscema, Ron Wilson's cover right here to issue 123. Giant Size Avengers covers. This is the preliminary layout by Gil Kane. And then the final original art right there to that particular cover. And more internal pages here. George Tusca. Vince Coletta on inks. Mike, uh, Mike Esposito inking the legendary George Pettis right there. Gil Kane and Dan Atkins. More Don Heck and George Pettis right here. And let's take a look at the binding. You have 856 pages. And it has sewn binding printed at the iMac printer. So let's go back to some of these lighter pages. Like the pinks here is a little bit of bleed through, but you can mainly see it through the white pages. Uh, these don't count because these are faded out pictures in the back. I was looking for something like this where you can kind of see the frame from the opposite side. So it's very minimal bleed through coming. Like it's it's got the same paper stock that the first four new printings have, and then I wanted to come back to this so you can see what the gutter loss look like. So there is a little bit of gutter loss. I mean, you have to hold it down to see the whole picture, but you know, I know it bothers some people and not others, but it's always I would try to be thorough. And that, as they say, is Avengers Assemble. If you're interested in purchasing this omnibus, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answered within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. 
They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this particular omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you plan on picking it up, if that's the way you're collecting Avengers, or you're doing the epic route, or you're doing the Marvel Masterwork route. The, no matter what it is, I would love to know all those answers down below. And if you hope to see a Volume 6 sometime. I love the fact that we are now at a Volume 5, and hopefully we'll get... A volume six and seven and don't have to wait too long i just love having all of these big books on the shelf uh but that's it everyone if you have any questions leave them down below smash that like button subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet check out our patreon amazing ways to support the channel everyone stay healthy and safe out there much love